first tell people that I play Division I football in the South, the first question that they typically ask me is whether my mom was ever worried about me getting hurt. What I typically tell them is that, although she probably had her own worries, as any good parent would do, what she really didn't see coming was me showing up for Christmas looking like this. <laughs> when I then tell them I'm a neuroscientist, studying the effects of head injuries on the brain, this is when things get really interesting because the idea that football and brain science can work together catches people off guard. At this point in our conversation, I can usually feel that burning desire they have to ask me this one question, which I think many people in this room have or will have to ask themselves. With everything that we know about head injuries, should we let our kids play football? Now, the reason why this question is so puzzling is because, on one side, we can appreciate that the consequences of sport concussions are real. We hear about the stories of athletes who struggle with long-term symptoms, and we think, hmm, is it really worth it? Should I let my kids play? What about the other parents? What would they think of me? Now, while all this is happening in our head, we can also think of all the great teaching tools that sport can bring into a child's life. Whether it's how that, that's how to handle adversity or how to be a competitor, the truth is that playing a team sport like football can really make a difference in someone's life. So, as you've all guessed it, yes, I think that we should let our kids play football. Not only because football is a lot of fun, but because I think that life is characterized by the opportunities that we get to grow as young men in our community. And for me, Football made that difference. With that being said, I do have a few conditions before I let my kids play. And the need for reducing injuries is on top of my list. But before I get deeper into this, let me ask you all to close your eyes and think of the first image that comes to your head when I say the word safety. Usually, when I ask this question, about 80% of people think of a helmet. And that's fair because, and I see everybody's like, yeah, yeah, that's, that was me. And that's fair because for most of our life, from the time that we were kids, we're constantly reminded that wearing a helmet will protect our brain against injuries. But here's the thing. Helmets, they do a great job at protecting your head against catastrophic injuries, like skull fractures. And for that reason, you should most definitely wear your helmet when you ride your bike. However, Helmets do not protect the brain against concussion. And here's why. Imagine for a second that I'm holding an egg. Think of the shell of the egg as a skull and the yolk inside the egg as the brain. Now what if I grab the second egg and I wrap this one in lots of bubble wrap? If I were to drop both eggs, I think that we can all agree that one would crack and one wouldn't. But whether the shell was protected or not, wouldn't affect the yolk inside the egg was being shaken. Ah. Just like helmets cannot prevent the brain from moving inside the head. So if helmets won't do the trick, we really have to rethink about the way we think about the word safety. And that's tricky because the word safety in football language often resonates as a threat to the sport. This is an interview with star linebacker Clay Matthews from the Green Bay Packers. Clay is pissed off because he was just penalized during the game for making a hit on the quarterback, which according to new rules to protect players was not allowed. For Clay and for a lot of athletes, rule changes that limits their playing style threatens the integrity of football. And that makes our job much harder as scientists because as soon as coaches or players see this, they start to associate safety-driven initiatives with efforts to take away that physical factor that makes football so special. Even if those, those rules are implemented with the right intentions, it just feels as though something, or even someone, is trying to take away part of what defines their identity as football players. With that in mind, our team went back to the drawing board and started to brainstorm about a better approach that we could use to make safety more appealing to athletes. And that was necessary because helmets can't prevent the concussions. And if resistance to rule changes inhibits their ability to make the game safer, then we need a solution 
that allows us to protect the brain while minimizing exposure to head impacts. And this is when it finally clicked. Performance. In sports, the word performance has a popular connotation for the pursuit of excellence. Performance testing, performance training, performance enhancing supplements. All these terms are familiar to the athletes because they allow them to reach their greatest dreams. And so for us to appeal to that competitive nature, we needed to talk about safety in the context of driving performance. And once we looked at it from that perspective, it made a lot more sense to us because if we could teach athletes that safer play is better play, well then we could start integrating both safety and performance tools as a way to enhance how the game is played while minimizing head impacts. We call this new approach safety-driven performance enhancement. And to implement this concept in the community, we launched an initiative called the Neural Protection Project. The good news is though, since we've launched the project about a year ago, we've worked with over 20 teams and over 1,500 athletes, which really speaks to the organization's commitment to make the game safer. Reflecting on that success, I realized that there are three keys that made the project an effective tool for safer sports. One, the project is a tool not a threat. And what I mean by that is that the project was designed to assist and enhance coaching practices, not replace them. Two, the project uses affordable technologies like GoPro cameras, which allows us to keep the cost down while democratizing access to performance tools across all sport levels. And by then, we can scale quickly. Lastly, and this is important, the project integrates safety as a catalyst for performance. With, with the help of sports science. And by science, I mean that our methods are informed by what the data tells us. This allows us to customize the information to each sport organization based on their needs, with the objective to improve how we train athletes to become more performant using knowledge from safer practices. So now that we have this new platform, how do we use it to help teams win more football games? And this is really where we must shift our vision towards the fact that safety and performance are not mutually exclusive. Instead, they are codependent in optimizing the ways that we allow for athletes to become the best version of themselves. In other words, to win more football games, we have to have our best athletes on the field. And to do so, we must reduce their chance for getting hurt. Let me show you what I mean. And from a performance standpoint, the 40-yard dash is a staple. Here, athletes are asked to sprint for 40 yards as fast as they can, so they can record a time in seconds. From this video, you can see that you can get information about a player's speed using the 40-yard dash. However, can it really help us determine which of these two athletes is at a greater risk for a concussion? Not really. What we do know, however, is that one athlete is faster than the other. And this is key because this number now becomes a reference, something tangible that the athletes can track over time and compare it with their teammates as a way to assess how well they did and figure out what they can do to get better. It's not rocket science. It's just how athletes are wired up. They're all competitors. And they embrace a process by which we can learn from our mistakes and fine-tune your skills to improve performance. And so it became obvious to us that to ingrain safety as a performance tool, we needed to quantify it. We needed a number, something that we can compare and contrast athletes based on their risk of injury. And this is when we thought to ourselves, what if we had a football drill? A drill through which we could assess a player's ability to make a safe tackle and identify technical weaknesses that we could use to modify the risk of injury. Let's watch the same two athletes go through one of our preseason assessments. And again, try to identify which of the two athletes is at a greater risk for a head injury. As a coach, or even a parent, this is an easy pick. Although the left player was originally faster on a 40-yard dash, he doesn't use very good technique to make that tackle. At contact, he's leaning with his head and increasing his risk of injury. On the other hand, the right-hand player comes in contact under control 
keeping his eyes up and driving through his hips. The reason why I'm showing this video is because we must appreciate that athletes come in a variety of shapes, sizes, and skill sets. But despite those differences, what they share in common is that the individual risk for injury is ingrained within the way that they engage in contact on the football field. Whether that's a tackle or making a block, the truth is that to identify that risk and turn it into a performance tool, we need to put a number on it. Just like the 40 yard dash helped us understand in a matter of seconds which athlete was faster. And this is what I love about being able to combine my passions for neuroscience, coaching, and medicine. Because we can finally leverage technology along with scientific progress to help us quantify, monitor, and improve safety as we strive to change the culture of our sport. And more importantly, we can now use this information to reduce sport concussions while optimizing the ways that we allow for safety to drive our pursuit for better performance. Thank you very much. Have a good day.